All right, so I started the recording. Just good afternoon, everybody. Um, if you haven't done so to start the class, so go into the classroom. I'll, I'll, give, I'll answer that question in a second. So first off, go into the classroom. Um, under course content, you'll see I opened up the next two weeks of um, uh, folders. So for this week, I have a lecture I'm going to do today if you haven't downloaded it. And then you'll see just a few hours before class. I don't know how many people actually saw my email, um, but, a, but a few hours before class, I posted this thing called T table used to find critical values. Did anybody see that email just out of curiosity? All right, we're going to use this uh, in class a little bit later. So you should download it and it should look like this. Okay. I'm going to show you how to read this statistical table. It's incredibly easy um, and we're going to use it a little bit later in class. Uh, then you'll notice here I have a folder called Thanksgiving week. Um, there, I'll make this announcement, but I'll say it now too. Um, I will not be here next Tuesday. Uh, so we will not be meeting our class. The college, you still have your other classes. Okay. I just will not be here Tuesday. Okay. Um, I hope that's okay with everybody. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, not even if it was not, not that, that I would uh, change plans or anything, but uh, all right. Uh, and then there was a question asked in the um, uh, chat. Do we have a choice? No, you don't have a choice. I'm not going to be here. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry guys. I always take off the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Um, there was a question posted in the chat about, uh, do we have uh, class? Do you have class on Wednesday? So when do, Wednesdays, as you, I agree, Dileski, um, Wednesday's a reading day. Um, if you, the college is open, but it's classified as a reading day, which means it's supposed to be a study day for you. So there are no classes held on Wednesday. Okay, there's no, nobody, no teacher should say they have class on Wednesday. Okay. So if they are saying that, you should really talk to them about that, okay? You should use the day as a reading day, though. You should use the day as a, as a study day, just, uh, just as reference. All right. So just quick announcements. Uh, as I said, there's no class next Tuesday. You, you do have your other classes, just not mine. I won't be here. Um, it's funny to say that, right? Because like, I will be here. I will be in my office, but I won't be in class. Um, and uh, if you look in the syllabus, uh, you have homework number five due uh, Thursday after Thanksgiving break, but I'm gonna change that due date, but I'm gonna post homework number five uh, tomorrow. Um, and the due date's going to be, I don't know the exact due date yet, but it's going to be due sometime very after Thanksgiving. Um, homework number five is just going to be on confidence intervals. Okay. And if you remember, we started confidence intervals um, last class. All right. So um, everybody okay if I get started in the lecture? Uh, uh, hi, hi, I am looking forward to, uh, no, it should be homework number five, right? So, uh, it should be homework number six, Never mind. Yeah, duh. I did that on purpose to see who was paying attention. Well done, everybody else missed it. Okay, yeah, homework number six, sorry about that. My bad. Uh, but I'll post that and I'll, uh, thank you. Thank you. And I'll set the due date. The due date's most likely gonna be Sunday the 6th. Okay. It's most likely gonna be Sunday the 6th. The syllabus says it's due Thursday the 3rd, but I'm gonna make it due Sunday the 6th probably. Okay. Thank you for the correction on the homeworks. Sorry about that. 
All right, any other questions or corrections to my inaccuracies so far today? Okay. All right, so this is what we were doing last class. Last class, what we were doing is we did an introduction to confidence intervals. And that's all we're gonna do today is more confidence interval stuff. And all a confidence interval is, if you remember, is it's a range estimate. I mean, by range, it's that interval part. Used to estimate the value of a parameter. Okay. And so what we were learning last class is we learned um, how to construct confidence intervals for a mean, okay, which was the Greek letter mu, okay, for some mean mu, when sigma was known. Right. And the formula we had for this was the following. You took your point estimate and you added and subtracted something. Does anybody remember what the second part of this formula was called? It started with an M. Margin error? Mm-hmm. I mean, you subtract, add and subtract away the margin of error. And the formula was just this from here. The point estimate is X bar, you add and subtract what we call the critical value, Z of alpha divided by two times the standard error, which was the population standard deviation over the square root of N. Professor, I just have a question. Sure. So I just watched the lecture from last class and I saw that um, the first, the, the, critical, the critical one, I saw you got that from a chart, right? But I got it said, from a, this chart right that, here. That one, yeah. But it said you had to divide it by two. So why did you put the whole actual? So, value? so what's 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 a little confusing is um, so I tried to simplify it because we are um, remote. Okay? okay. If if you were to this right here is at just shown, shown it blown up so you can see it. It's a Z critical value with the subscripted alpha divided by two, okay? So um, does anybody remember what, what alpha was? Like what, how I described it or what it was called? Like how many times you're correct? Uh, how many times you're wrong? Yeah, you have the right idea. Okay, so if you wanna be a 95% confidence interval, Okay, how often are you gonna be wrong? 5%. Okay, so that means alpha is 0 0.05. Okay. So you would take that 0 0.05 and divide it by two, and you get Z with a subscript of 0 0.025, okay? And now if we were in person instead of remote, I'd show you how to look this up um, uh, on the table instead of um, you know just giving it to you. Um, so this alpha divided by two is just notation that's attached to it. It doesn't, it's not an operator. Like don't divide anything by two. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, you just go to the table and be like, oh, Matt wanted a 95% confidence interval. Boom, the Z critical value is one. Oh, okay. I was so confused. I was like, why isn't he dividing it then? I got you. You should, you know, you should absolutely question my work, but uh, I, I'm sorry if I didn't make this clear. I just wanted to make it easy for you. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so uh, we did one example um, by hand, if you remember. And then I showed you guys, do you remember I showed you how to use your calculator at the end of class last time? Does that ring a bell? I got one yes, okay. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna lean very heavily on your calculator for all this stuff that remains um, 
uh, for the rest of the class, just because I think um, for two reasons. One, we're remote, right? And it's, it's a little hard. You guys are just watching, you know, a PowerPoint here instead of being in class. So I want to make it a little bit easier for you. Uh, and then number two, um, like nobody in the real world does statistics by hand. Okay. They always have like a, a cal not even a calculator, but like a computer program, um, something like uh, the programming language R, for example, or Minitab. They just have this program that does all the statistics for them. So that's what we're, you know, we're doing it as it would be done in the real world. All right, so we did this one example last class. Um, so I want to do one more, uh, actually I want to do two more examples. Um, then is everybody okay if I go on to the examples or any questions about this? Okay. So take out your, um, uh, take out your graphing calculator if you have, it doesn't matter if you have a TI-83 or TI-84, by the way. I'm just going to do it in the TI-84 today, but this is the case where the calculators look exactly the same if you have the TI-83 or TI-84, so it doesn't, doesn't matter, okay? All right, so um, here's a problem, okay? I'm going to read it and we'll talk about it. So calcium is the most abundant mineral in the human body and has several important functions. That's why they always tell you to drink your milk. Okay, most of the body calcium is stored in the bones and teeth, obviously, where it functions to support their structure. Okay, recommendations for a calcium intake. So how much calcium you should take are provided by uh, this dietary reference intake developed by the Institute for Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. So this is, I'm not making any of this up. Okay, so a lot of times, not all, a lot of, a lot of times I come into class and I make the examples up, but this one I didn't make up, okay. So the recommended adequate intake, which we call RAI for calcium for, now this is for adults who are ages 19 to 50, is 100 milligrams per day, okay? So you should be getting 100 milligrams per day, okay? So a random sample of 18 adults. Now, for some reason, this study where I found this problem was looking at people whose incomes were below the poverty level, okay? So we got 18 adults, okay? So you're, I'm just going to tell you what you're given right here. 18 or a thousand, I'm sorry, for what? No, you said you said 100 milligrams per day. It's a thousand milligrams per day. Oh, did I say 100? I'm sorry, yes, a thousand, I'm sorry. Again, I did that on purpose to see who was paying attention. Do you guys believe me when I say that or do you think I'm just a little sluggish today? Uh, no, I think you forgot your cup of coffee. No, no, you know what, hold on. You guys see my uh, screen here real quick? I got my cup of coffee. <laughs> okay. I, I, let, me show, let me show you something, okay? This you is got more, You got more milk than coffee in there. <laughs> Professor, you may have to add an espresso there. Yes, but here, you know what? I wanted to show you guys. This is my motivation coffee. Can you guys uh, read what it says? Uh, no. No one cares. Work harder. That's, <laughs> that's okay. what my... That's my motivation cup of coffee. <laughs> All right. Keeps me going. Every time I'm like, oh, Don, I got to work harder. I just read that and I'm like, yes, I do. All right. Anyways, we'll, we'll go back, okay? So as I was saying, it's a thousand, the recommended is 1,000 milligrams per day. Sorry about that. So a random sample of 18 adults with incomes below the poverty level. So just right at the start, you're given this, okay? You're given the sample size, okay? All right. And here is the 18 values, okay? You're also, if you, if you just take this, okay, I'm going to give you some relevant information here. Okay, note that the sample mean, if you were to plug this in your calculator, I'm also telling you the sample mean is 947.4 milligrams. Okay, the next thing it says is assume the population standard deviation for daily calcium intake, so sigma is 188 milligrams, okay? So look, here, here's what these next problems on confidence intervals are gonna be. I'm gonna give you these three things, all right? And then what you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to um, construct a confidence interval for. All right, can I go to the, uh, 
The next slide. Okay, but just before I do, all right, um, what do you think this problem is going to be about? Like, um, what adults who have what are we going to be interested in studying? Or what are we looking at here? So if you look here, what we're talking about is adults with incomes below the poverty level, right? That's, that's, what, that's what we're investigating here, okay? That's, that's what this is gonna be about. All right, so the next one, I got three questions for you, all right? So the first one is, let's construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval for the mean calcium intake, mu, okay, of all adults with incomes below the poverty level, all right? So this is what I'm asking you to, to construct. Construct a 90% confidence interval for mu, okay? And what the mean is, is the, the population mean that we're investigating here is the mean calcium intake for adults with incomes below poverty level. I'm just gonna stop at poverty because I'm running out of space there. All right, so let's do this one by hand, just as a practice, okay? All right, so by hand, all right, you're just gonna use this formula, X bar, add and subtract, Z of alpha divided by two, times sigma over the square root of n. So there's only four things here, okay? Did I tell you, if we look back at the previous slide, did I tell you what the, what the sample mean intake was? Yeah, look, it's uh, 947.4. Okay, the next thing you need to find is this critical value right here, all right? So let me, where is it on the chart? Right here, okay? I wanted a 90% critical, or a confidence interval, excuse me. Looking at this chart here, what is the Z critical value? If I wanna be 90% confident. Yeah, yeah, so level of confidence, boom, 90%. So that critical value is 1.645, that's it, okay? So I'm gonna plug in 1.645 here. Sigma I gave you, okay, I told you to assume it's 188. And how many adults did I sample or did this study sample? Okay. So it's always worth it, okay, to take the two minutes, not even the 30 seconds, all right, to, to grab your calculator and practice this with me, okay? So let's do the margin of error, okay? You're going to take 1.645, you're going to multiply it by 188, and then you have to divide that by the square root of 18. All right, how many people got that? Okay. So I'm just gonna round this to one decimal place. So it's 72.9, okay? So it's 947.4, add and subtract 72.9. Oh my God, why did I forget it already? 72.9. Okay, so now you have the lower bound of the interval. That's the subtraction part. So it's 947.4 minus 72.9. Can somebody help me out with that with their calculator? Tell me what it is. Uh, 
I got it. 947.4. Thank you. Minus uh, 72.9. I think you should get this number, right? 847.5, did anybody else get that? That's okay, Marcos, no big deal. 874.5. And now the upper bound is just you add 947.4 plus 72.9. And you should get this. All right, a thousand and twenty point three. All right, so that's just constructing it. Okay. Now what we need to do is we need to interpret it. Okay, like what is what what does this confidence interval even mean for us? Okay, so this is interpret. And this is some standard verbiage, okay, that you could use. And it goes like this, based on this sample, we are 90% confident the mean calcium intake by adults with incomes below the poverty level is between 874.5% is between milligrams and 1,020.3 milligrams. Okay. Let me just say, let me ask you a follow-up question for this, okay? Um, well, first off, does everybody, was everybody okay with the calculations for this? By hand, it's still pretty straightforward. Don't worry, we're gonna do the next one with the calculator so you can see. Um, okay, so let me go back just for a second and then I'll come back to this, okay? Suppose this researcher did this study and they thought, that's okay, you can write caps. It was like you're excited, yes, you know. Um, suppose this researcher thought that uh, people with, uh, with um, incomes below the poverty level got less calcium intake daily than, than the recommended adults, okay? So do adults, with incomes below poverty level consume less calcium on average than the daily required intake or recommended intake. Okay, so remember, it's recommended that you should get 1,000 milligrams per day, okay? So what we're saying is, look, this is what our confidence interval is, okay? We're saying the mean could be anywhere between 874.5 all the way up to 1,020.3, okay? Is there evidence to suggest then that um, adults with incomes below the poverty level consume less calcium on average than, they sh than the recommended amount? What do you think? Crickets, no one's gonna. Well, let me ask this. What was the recommended amount per day that they should consume, that people should consume, like myself? Okay, you should consume, you should consume, should consume 1,000 milligrams a day, okay? Obviously, you know, people aren't gonna consume 1,000 milligrams per day. What, you know, what they're really saying is like, look on average, just get 1,000 in, okay? 
Does a thousand fall in this interval? Like is a thousand between these two numbers? Yeah, it is, right? It's closer to this end, but it's definitely between these two numbers. So what we're saying is, is look, we can't, because a thousand is in there, there's no evidence to suggest that um, the mean isn't is a thousand. So we, we would say that, yeah, they, they probably, you know, we can't say that they consume less than the required intake on average per day. We just can't say that. And that's just because the thousand is in here. Because a confidence interval means it could be any number in here, any number in here, including a thousand, which is the required, recommended required intake. All right, let's just do this one with our calculator now. Okay, just so you can see. Like, I, I think the formula is pretty straightforward to follow, but let's, let's now construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval. All right, so grab your trusty calculator. All right, so to do this in your calculator, everybody, hopefully we're, we're, you have your calculator in hand. Hit the stat button, okay? Next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna scroll over to tests. And does anybody remember the option you're looking for here or want to use? Yep, you want Z interval, number seven. Thank you. Yep. So you want Z interval here. So there's two options here. There's one if you just have the data, which we did, but I also gave you the summary stats. So you're going to scroll over to number seven, or you're going to scroll over to stats, and you're going to hit enter. All right, now you should see sigma, all right? The value of sigma I gave you was 188. What was the value of X bar? I think it was nine, yep, thank you. And what was our sample size? Yep. So the confidence level, C level, is always defaulted to 0.95. Okay, so if it was 0.90, I just, 90%, I just change it to 0 0.90. So I'm going to leave it as 0.95 here. Then I'm going to hit calculate. Okay, and you should see this. All right, how many people got the, these values here? Okay, yeah. So I, I think doing it by hand, uh, yeah, what do you need to see me redo? Just the options in the calculator? Can you show how, can you, show how you, um, you got that? Like, I didn't catch that. That's okay, no problem. You're gonna hit the stat button. You're gonna scroll over to tests. And it should be the same thing in the TI-83, it doesn't matter. And you should go down and you should see Z interval. Do you see that in your calculator? Yes, thank you. No problem. Yep, and then just want to scroll over to stats, hit enter, and then in plug, plug in all this. All right, so a lot of people got this. This is great. So it, it was pretty straightforward to do it by hand, but is it also pretty easy to do it with the calculator? Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you just prefer to have the calculator do it for you? I think so. I, it is much easier, yeah? Yeah. All right, so th this one here, it's gonna be 860.55 all the way to 1034.2. I'm gonna tack on a zero here, so it's the same thing. Okay, so just how we would interpret this, just again, the... And it just goes like this, based on this sample.
we are 95% confident. that the mean calcium intake by adults with incomes below the poverty level let's say is between Eight, uh, I'm sorry, 860, sorry, I was copying just above, 860.55 milligrams. And it could be as high as 1,034.20 milligrams. Okay, so, next question. What happened to the confidence interval as the level of confidence increased? Did the, did the intervals get wider or narrower? Basically what I'm saying, what happened to the width of the interval? Did the width of the interval get larger or smaller as you went from a 90 to 95? Yeah, it got wider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. So whenever you increase the level of confidence, the confidence interval just has to get wider. That's it. What do you guys think? I like that answer. Fine. That's what my wife says when, when she's not too happy with me, but just wants to move on. Hey, how are you? Fine. Don't tell her I said that. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. I think you'll be able to handle one of these on the, on the next, uh, on the last exam of the course. I got one. Yes. I'm going to do one more. I'm going to do, I'm going to do one more. All right, let's do one more. Okay. Just so we're, we have, maybe we'll feel a little bit better. Sound good. Everybody. Okay. If I, everybody's good. If I move on. Nobody needs to copy anything. Okay. All right, so I came across this problem. Um, oftentimes I, I, maybe this is embarrassing to admit, but a lot of times I, I just read textbooks, old statistics test textbooks to find good problems. Um, everyone is like, Matt, you need to get a life. But um, I came across this problem I thought was, a, data was a little interesting. This is about uh, computers per household. So what we want to do is we want to estimate the mean number of how of computers per household in the United States. Okay, things like iPads don't count for this. Tablets don't count, okay, just computers. Um, so this would be laptops and desktop computers. Um, I'm just curious. So how, what do you think the mean number of computers per household is in the United States? I'm, just, I'm actually legit curious what people think. That's why I'm asking. Three, not bad. Four, two, 
two. It's it's really interesting, right? Because this is this is all the households across the United States. Like for example, in my household, my wife and I have we have five computers in our house. Okay, um, my wife has uh, two Macs, <laughs> an old one, and I I just got her a new one. And then I have two laptops. Plus I, I have this big desktop. So I like, I, you know, I'm like, Oh, you know, five, that, that, that seems reasonable, but that's actually like extreme. Okay. But it's the mean of all the households across the United States. So this is like everybody. So in a sample of 150 households, okay. The mean, number of computers was found to be 1.75 actually. So it was pretty close to two, okay? And let's assume the population standard deviation here is 0 0.51, okay? Let's construct and let's interpret a 99% confidence interval for the mean. So 99. Okay, um, what's the easiest way to do this again? Calculator or by hand? Yeah, yeah, so calculator. So look, let's make it easy on ourselves. Let's grab our trusty calculators, okay? But even before we do, let's talk about what's given, okay? Uh, how many households were sampled for this? What's our sample size? Yep, so N is 150. What was the sample mean? Yep. And I give you sigma. Yeah, it's right there, it's 0 0.51. Okay, I tell you what the population standard deviation is, yep. So using calculator. Okay, you're just using these options. You're going stat, tests, Z interval. Always, always, always for this specific type of problem. Stat, test, number seven. So you have the stats right here. So you're just gonna have to replace, uh, I'm sorry, I, I hit the wrong thing. I hit, uh, I went to number eight on accident, sorry. So 0 0.51, 1.75, 0.51. And then 150. And then what do I have to change? What did I ask for? Yep, I asked for a 99% confidence interval. So you just have to change the C level to 0 0.99. How many people got this? Awesome. Okay, so we'll just do, um, we'll go to two decimal places. So it's 1.64 to 1.86 when I round it. All right, so just again, so just so we're clear, based on this sample,
we are 99% confident the mean number of computers per household is between it could be anywhere between 1.64 computers and as high as 1.86 computers. I think you're all, I feel better having seen a second example. Let me just ask uh, a question from this, okay? Like, it's one thing to just be able to plug it into your computer, your calculator, and use some standard verbiage. Like, let me, let me, let me um, uh, ask you a follow-up to this. Like, how, like a, you know, maybe a, see if you can take it a step further. Uh, can anybody, uh, does anybody need me to um, pause for a second or can I go on? One go on. Okay. So here's a follow up question. A researcher claims, so they claim that the mean number of computers per household has dramatically increased over the years. And that on average, there are two computers per household. So this researcher says, you know what? Things have changed. Technology has gotten, you know, um, it's so cheap to buy computers that on average there's two computers per household, okay? Does your confidence interval support his claim, his or her claim. Okay. So the researcher says, hey, the, on average there's two computers per household, come on. Um, and you're looking at your confidence interval, does it support his claim or, or, or not? Or does it refute his claim? You're right, it doesn't. Uh, you want to expand on that? Why you don't think so? Yeah, so this was our confidence interval, okay? So our confidence interval said, look, we're 99% sure the mean is somewhere between 1.64 and 1.86. Oh my God, why can't I remember numbers after I say them? 1.64 to 1.86. Okay. Is two outside our confidence interval? So if we're 99% sure it's between these two numbers, uh, his claim, it, it, we have no evidence to support his claim, okay? So our confidence interval does 
not support the claim. Since the number two is outside the interval. Okay, so that's just one practical application of confidence intervals right there, like to use it to test, a, to test somebody's claim like that. All right, what do you think? Good? Just mirrored did those 47 minutes fly by. Flew by for me. I hope they flew by for you guys. All right, this is a good spot to take our 10 minute break, okay? Let's be back at 1.57 p.m., okay? Uh, and then we're going to, if you haven't done so during the break, um, just download and have this table. Yep, I'll go back in a second, yep. So just for this table, if you didn't download it or you came in late to class, um, it's under week 12, this T table, have this ready for the second part of class, okay? And I'll just leave it on this slide here if that's okay with everybody. All right, so I'll be back at uh, 157.
All right, everybody, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right, what do you say we, uh, we finish up? Just one second. All right. Um, it's just a little FYI, my wife just got home from a walk with my son. So if you hear him crying, it's getting near his nap time. Just to, just to forewarn you all. Yeah, oh. <laughs> it's teething, so it's not been a fun couple, couple of weeks. All right. So we wanted to now talk about a, um, continue with confidence intervals, okay? But talk about something new um, called a T distribution. Okay, so what I'm going to show you in the class that we have today, uh, what I have time left to do is I'm going to show you how to read a new statistical table. Um, and also, I know I say this like all the time, but do you notice how like I explain a concept and it's a little weird and then once we do an example, it doesn't sound too bad. Yes, all the time. <laughs> Uh, the, the next 20 minutes or so is going to be exactly like that. I have to introduce this, this concept or this new distribution called the T distribution. Um, and so just bear with me as I go through it. I'm going to just give you the highlights of the concept. Uh, and then we're going to just, as soon as I get through the main topics of the T distribution, we're going to jump right into a, um, uh, an example with it. Okay. So what this next section is about is it's about confidence intervals. for a mean, and this is how it's done in the real world, okay? So what we just spent the last hour doing, while very important, because it's basically the same procedure we're gonna do going forward, is it's not really how it's done in the real world, okay? Um, so from the previous section, So in the previous slides, you were given sigma, okay? You were told, assume the population standard deviation is this. Like, I'm just gonna go back real quick. Like in every problem, like assume the population standard deviation is 188 milligrams. Here, assume the population standard deviation for number of computers is 0 0.15, okay? So like, you're just, you're just given sigma. Okay. But in the real world, you won't know Sigma. Okay. You just won't know it. Okay. It won't be given. Okay. So you need it though. You need the standard deviation for the formula. Okay, you, you need it, like our, our, our formula depended on uh, the standard deviation. So if you don't know sigma, okay, you don't know the population standard deviation, then you just estimate it. So you estimate sigma with S. Does anybody remember what, and it's, I know it's been a while, but what the letter S stood for in statistics? For sleep. Say that again. <laughs> I think you made a joke, right? Yeah, I said for sleep. For sleep. Well, yeah. Well, you know, if you ever have a kid, forget it. You'll never sleep again. Well, I got six of them, so I feel you. I think I think you're lying to me. Uh, 
or if you're not, I'm sorry. I send my condolences. <laughs> okay. So what S stands for is the sample standard deviation. Okay. So you're going to take your sample set of data and you, since you don't know what sigma is, you're just going to estimate it from your sample set of data with the, what's called the sample standard deviation. But that causes a problem. So if you look at our formula for a confidence interval, it's X bar, add and subtract um, Z of alpha divided by two um, times sigma over the square root of N. That was our, our, our problem before. So you're gonna replace sigma with S in the formula, okay? Does anybody remember when you see the Z, um, uh, Z critic or the Z value, like what um, type of distribution the Z comes from? It was like Z scores. I don't know if you guys remember when we were doing Z scores and the Z scores came from the, the standard normal table, okay? But here's what happens. This is the theory behind it. When you replace Sigma with S, you can no longer use Z critical values. Okay, you just can't do it anymore. So what ends up happening is your estimate. Okay, specifically X bar in this case are no longer normally distributed. It turns out that you're gonna, they, instead of using a T here, they follow what's called a T distribution. And I'm gonna explain to you what a T distribution is. Um, but first, I wanna give you just a little history because I think the history in this case is really interesting. Um, when you learn mathematics, um, like when you learn algebra and geometry, the, the, that those topics are thousands of years old. Okay, calculus is a couple hundred years old, um, right? Discovered by Newton, I, oh God, it was in the fourteen hundreds. Um, but statistics and probability is like a really new field, a relatively new field of um, study. So this this t distribution that I'm going to talk to you about was discovered uh, around the turn of the. Um, uh, to the turn of the 20th century, so around 1900. And it was discovered by a mathematician who was working for a company that's still around today. Um, have you all heard of the company called the Guinness Brewing Company? Have you guys heard of this? All right, what does Guinness make? What does Guinness Brewing Company make? Yeah, they make beer, they make a beer. I'm, I'm, I'm not making this up, okay? I'm being honest with you. So Guinness used to employ mathematicians to be their brewmasters, okay? And so there was this mathematician named Gassat who discovered um, that when you use S for sigma, you can't use a normal distribution anymore. And he discovered it and he was like, oh my gosh, this is really groundbreaking for statistics. So I want to publish my results and Guinness told him he couldn't do it. They're, they're like, look, you're a private employee. You can't publish your results. That's our property. So he ended up publishing it anonymously under the name student. So sometimes you hear the distribution referred to as the student's T distribution, but it was actually studied by a man who was, you know, working as a brewmaster for Guinness Brew Company, <laughs> which I think is really cool. Which I think is really cool. Um, I'm just curious, has anyone ever been to Ireland? That's where the Guinness factory is. If you ever go to Ireland, um, you should you should stop by the Guinness factory. It's really cool. You can take a tour of it. Um, so I did this. I don't know when when I went to Ireland. Gosh, 
10 years ago now. It's been a while. Um, but they actually, as you go on the tour, they actually have a plaque for Gassat. And it says discover the tea distribution with inside their factory. It's really, it's really cool. So anyways, whenever you have your first Guinness, and I'm not saying you should have one, but whenever you have your first Guinness, you should <coughs> cheers to the uh, tea distribution. Okay. I did. I went with, I went with one of my childhood friends and we, as soon as we got to the top of the Guinness Brewing Factory, they give you a free beer and we cheers to Gassat. All right. So what exactly is a tea distribution? So if you look uh, in the classroom, okay, if you load up this tea table here, okay, you should see this. All right, just out of curiosity, how many people have this here? I have this loaded up with me? I got one person, a couple, okay. This is exactly what a tea distribution looks like, okay? So now here's the thing. What does that tea distribution just look like? Like if I didn't tell you this was a tea distribution, what would you say this looked like? What have we been drawing a bunch of? Yeah, it starts with, a, yeah, it just looks like a bell curve, right? Like you, this just looks like a bell curve, okay? So the tea distribution is, is really, really close to a normal distribution. It's, it's like super close, okay? There's just a few subtle differences, okay? So let me give you the properties of the tea distribution. Okay. The T distribution, a lot like that it was said in there, Z, okay. Um, the area under the curve is equal to one, okay. What that means is it's a probability distribution. Okay, just like the Z curve, okay. The T distribution is centered at zero, okay. So just like, just like the standard normal curve. Okay, it's just like the standard normal curve in that case, okay? So you're looking at this and it's like, well, what, how is this any different uh, from a bell curve? Again, just like the bell curve, the curve is symmetric. Okay, again, just like the standard normal curve. But now, now what is the difference? Okay, so the T distribution looks like a normal curve. Just with more area in the tails. So basically the crux of the T distribution is like the following. Whenever you estimate sigma with S, you introduce more variation, more estimation into your statistics. So to account for that, there has to be more area in the tails. It's just not as centered around the, the, the value zero, of this T distribution. The fifth property is the T distribution
looks different. based on the sample size. And what I mean by that is um, in statistics in general, do you think it's better to have a larger or smaller sample size? Like if you wanna estimate stuff, larger, right? Larger, 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 larger. So what happens is, is with the T distribution, as you increase your sample size, all right, it's going to look different. And by look different, what I mean by that is as the sample size increases, the T distribution looks more normal. And when I say looks more normal, I mean normally distributed. Okay. Let me know when I can um, uh, go to the next slide. That's okay, I won't go yet. Gives me a chance to finish off my coffee real quick. All right, so let me, um, problems five and six, like what do I mean by uh, T distribution looks different based on the sample size. And as the sample size increases, the T distribution looks more normal. Let me just show you a visual of this. So what I'm gonna draw here first This is supposed to represent a normal distribution. How does it look? Does it not look okay? Not my best work, but still pretty good. Everyone's supposed to say it looks great. Thank you. A few people, a few people get it. Okay. Uh, so what I want to draw here first is a T distribution, okay, of sample size, let's say 10, okay. So this one on top in red here, this is a T distribution size 10, okay. Does this look like a normal curve, but just short, I hate to use these, these words, but shorter and, and a little bit like wider in the tails. Yeah, yeah, it just, it just, it looks like a normal distribution, still centered at zero, but it's just instead of more area under the curve, centered in the middle, it's more area in the tails. That's what I mean by the tail areas get larger. And now let me just draw a T distribution now. I don't know, size 50, where the sample size is 50. Okay. That was a terrible one. You can mock me for that one. But do you notice how as you increase the sample size, it gets more and more normal, but it's not perfectly normal. That's, that's the whole concept of the T distribution. Okay. So for now, like, trust me, I know when I introduce the T distribution, it's a lot, a lot I, I can't even see your faces and I'm sure everyone's like, what is going on? Um, I'm gonna show you next how we're gonna use it, okay? Um, 
And it's very, it's actually incredibly simple how we're going to use it. Is everybody okay if I go to the next uh, slide? All right, so when will we use this? Okay. So the T distribution will be used for confidence intervals, which I'm going to show you next. And two, in the next section, when we get to hypothesis testing. It's our next and last section. Isn't that crazy? This class like flew by. So the T distribution will be used for confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Whenever you use the sample standard deviation which is the letter S instead of the population standard deviation sigma. Okay, so whenever you use S instead of sigma, you're gonna need a T distribution, okay? And you'll see the subtle difference in the problems. I promise you after we do one or two examples, it'll be like, oh yeah, 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 that makes sense, Matt. All right, is everybody okay if I move on? I got one yes. So I want to introduce the, the how you use the T distribution and how you're going to read this table here um, with an example. Okay, so instead of being like, oh, you know, this is how you read the table, let me introduce it with an example. All right, so why do we need this type of confidence interval? Um, this, this, the slides are a little old. Um, I should have changed it to COVID because COVID is a SARS virus. But um, do you guys remember a few years ago, um, they had this thing called the H1N1 virus. It was referred globally as the SARS virus. I get, no, you don't, you don't have, it's okay if you don't remember it. Um, so the SARS virus, gosh, this was, gosh, this was 10, 15 years ago, okay? And it comes up now because of um, COVID, because COVID is a, is a form of the SARS virus, okay? But suppose, suppose you're tasked, okay? Um, there's this new SARS virus. Okay, let's just even imagine that. Okay, suppose you want to estimate what's called um, the mean. So you want to estimate the average incubation period. Okay. Does anybody know what an incubation period is for a virus? No, anybody, anybody here? Yeah, okay, so exactly, thank you. An incubation period is um, after you've come in contact with the virus, all right, so like after you come in contact with this virus, how long until you start showing symptoms? Okay. Like even put it in the context of COVID nowadays, do you think knowing the average incubation period of, of a virus like SARS or COVID is really important? Like, you know, as a, as a, you know, global community, we want to fight this virus, right? You know, and so um, we'd really like to know how long, you know, after you've come in contact till you start showing symptoms, right? Like it's, it's important. 
Okay, so how would you do this if you wanted to estimate the mean incubation period? Well, in statistics, you just take a sample, right? So this is an actual study that I have here. I'm not making up any of these numbers, okay? Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a report that came out by the CDC of, of the actual SARS virus, okay, years ago. So in a sample of 81 SARS patients, it was found that the mean incubation period was 3.8 days with a standard deviation of 15.1 days. So the in incubation period for individuals is um, a right skewed distribution. Okay. Um, notice here. You estimated the standard deviation. with S, okay, with the sample standard deviation, and we're not given sigma, okay? All right, so let me ask you just this question, okay? So the CDC did this report on the SARS virus, and they got the um, mean incubation period to be 3.8 days. Do you think that for the SARS virus, the, the, the average incubation period is exactly 3.8 days, like it is, it is exactly 3.8 days for everyone, the average? No, yeah, it's not. It's not exactly 3.8 days, okay? Because, because why? Why is it probably not exactly 3.8 days? This data is just a sample of how many people? Yeah, okay, so, so, so this report that the CDC put out is just, just an analysis of 81 people who had SARS. And they said, look, out of the 81 people who had SARS, on average, their incubation period was 3.8 days. But we know, right? Like we know if you were to sample another 81 SARS patients, you'd get a different mean, okay? So, that, so it's just like, well, what is the real mean, okay? And this is why we need confidence intervals, okay? So, 3.8 days is not the real mean incubation period. So what is? Well, there's no way we could actually know that. Like there's just, there's no way, okay? There's no way we can talk to every single person who had SARS and get, the, get, get their incubation period. Okay, so since we can't know it, we have to estimate it then with the confidence interval. So we're gonna actually do a confidence interval that the CDC actually did for this SARS virus, okay? <clears throat> Everybody okay if I go to the next slide? Okay. All right, so how do we construct a confidence interval specifically here when you're given S instead of sigma? Okay, the confidence interval is still the same formula. It's a range of values. So it's a lower bound to an upper bound. So the formula for confidence intervals is still always, always, always. It's the point estimate, okay? Add and subtract the margin of error, okay? Here's the subtle difference here, okay? The margin of error is still the critical value times the standard error, but the critical value is no longer Z of alpha divided by two. We need a new critical value, okay? And this is what our confidence interval looks like, okay? It's X bar, add and subtract what we see here. Do you guys see how it's now T of alpha divided by two instead of Z? Do you just see the subtle difference? And we use S instead of sigma, okay? So you're just gonna have to use the T distribution. So basically all that's happening is you're replacing 
z of alpha divided by two with t of alpha divided by two. And you're replacing sigma with s, okay? This t of alpha divided by two is what's called a t critical value. And if you look here, this is why this table is amazing. This is what the table is called, t distribution critical values, okay? So this table here, all right, unlike the normal curve, this table does not give area under the curve. It does not, it does not, it does not. It gives just these critical values that you use for confidence intervals. This is what it gives, okay? So if you look here on the table, there's a, there's a, a column header that's called DF. Does everybody see that DF right there? And then there's all these numbers. Da, 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 da. And then up top, you have this thing called upper tail probability. Do you all see that as well? So we, we, need to, we need to find this thing called DF and this thing called upper tail probability. They're actually incredibly easy, okay? The DF stands for degrees of freedom, okay? And the degrees of freedom is just the formula N minus one. So it's just the sample size minus one, okay? And where does this N minus one come from? If you remember, and it's okay if you don't remember, but the formula for the sample standard deviation is the square root of the sum of each X value minus the mean squared divided by N minus one. That's where the degrees of freedom comes from. And the upper tail probability is equal to alpha divided by two. And remember just alpha, all right, comes from the level of confidence. Okay. So I'm gonna, we're gonna work this um, by hand. I'm just going to, uh, I just wanna change it just a little bit, give us a little bit more space. Sorry about that. Okay, so this formula, I'm go we're gonna first do it by hand, just so you can see how to read the table. All right, and then we'll do, and then eventually I'm gonna show you how to do it with your calculator. Okay, so it can make everything easier. All right, is everybody okay if I move on or does everybody still need this? Everybody's good. Everybody's just like, is it Thanksgiving break yet? Is that what everybody's thinking? Okay. So I just want to, I just moved it up a little just so I had room. So I have the problem worked out um, on, on a previous slide here. So I want to just do it by hand with us instead of just going through the slides with it. Okay. So here was the problem. In a sample of 81 SARS patients, it was found that the mean incubation period was 3.8 days and the standard deviation was 15.1 days, okay? So what I wanna do is I wanna construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the mean incubation period. All right, 95% confidence interval. If you want to be 95% confident, what's my alpha equal to here? Yep, but yeah, you just have to make sure to always change it to a decimal. So it's 0 0.05. Okay. Notice how you're given S as we said here. You're going to, whenever you're given this S, you're going to need to use the T distribution.
All right, so our confidence interval when you have S, just to go back, is this formula right here. It's X bar, add and subtract, T of alpha divided by two times S over the square root of N. All right, look, let's just replace what we know. Okay, we know what X bar is. That's 3.8. Right now, I have no idea what this is. So I'm gonna to have to look this up, okay? Yep, I can go back for a second. Here, Liliana? You're good? Okay. So look, the problem gives you S, it's 15.1. Gives you the sample size, it's 81. So it's the square root of 81. This problem, what you have to look up is this T of alpha divided by two. So this is just gonna be equal to some number. Well, I said you needed two things, the degrees of freedom, okay? Looking back here. Degrees of freedom is equal to the sample size minus one, all right? So what's my sample size here again? All right, so it's just 81 minus one gets me 80. Now look, on this table, degrees of freedom, if you scroll down the side, do you see 80? Does everybody see that? Do you see? I know I got one no in there, but if you look again, if you scroll down the side of this table, DF, do you see the 80 right there? There is no 81. Yep, there's no 81 because degrees of freedom is 81. You always, it's always N minus one, always. So it's, take the sample size and subtract one, okay? So that's why you get the 80, yep. And I'll just to note, if you ever get to a problem where, where, the, where the degrees of freedom are not there, like if the degrees of freedom are 84 or something, you just use the closest value for this table, okay? Now, the next thing you need is this thing called upper tail probability. I'm just gonna call it the UTP. And the formula for that is just alpha divided by two. Well, look, here's my alpha. So it's 0 0.05 divided by two. If you plug that in your calculator, you'd get 0 0.025. So look up at the top. Can you, do you see 0 0.025 right there? There's another way to do this that might even be easier if you don't like the upper tail probability. Does anybody remember what level of confidence I asked for this problem? Do you see it on the screen there? Yep. If you scroll down to the bottom, do you see confidence level? Do you see 95? You see that on the table? So it's the same thing as the upper tail probability here. So now just look where 80 intersects with that. All right, what number do you see right there? One point nine nine zero. And that's your critical value right there. So does it not, I know that was just, we only did it one time, but does it not seem too bad? And you guys here who just woke up? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm a little guy. 
he, he realized it was class time, so he wanted to say hi to everybody. So that just goes in here. And that's it. That's the only difference between the previous problems and the ones we were doing. Okay, it's just the critical value is just a little different. So now you just got to do this in your trusted calculator. So let's take this 1.990 times 15.1 divided by the square root of 81. How many people got that? Yeah. So I'll just round it to one decimal place to make it 3.3. Um, So then now we, now we can do our confidence interval. Our lower bound is the subtraction. So it's 3.8 minus 3.3. Oh my God, what does that get you? 0 0.5 and the upper bound is 3.8 plus 3.3, which I think gets you 8.1. No, 7.1. Oh. Woo. Thank you. So the 3.8 was X bar. Do you see it right here? X bar. That's where it comes from Liliana. And the 3.3 comes from the margin of error that we did in our calculator. And you can see I have it on the solutions here as well. Worked out a little bit neater. So the interpretation of this So look, the, here's what we're trying to do, okay? We are trying to estimate the mean incubation period of the SARS virus. So based on this sample, we are 95% confident the mean incubation of SARS, mean incubation period, excuse me, is between, it could be, the mean literally could be as low as half a day, 0 0.5 days, or it could be as high as over a week, 0 0.1 days. So that's one of the tricky things about combating these viruses is, and it is why when they say things like, if you've come in contact with somebody who has COVID, they're like, you need to isolate for 14 days. It's because they're like, you know, you may have the virus and not know it, you know, like the, the, the incubation period for, for COVID could be mean could be as high as 14 days. That's where this, these recommendations come from. All right, at least do the calculations make sense? Calculations not too bad. Okay, I do have some good news, right? What, what always makes this easier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you grab your calculator, hit stat, scroll over to tests. We were doing Z intervals now, but what do you see for option number eight there? Yeah. So if you know that you need to do a T interval, let's go to option number eight. And you'll have two options. Scroll over to the one that says stats. And you gotta forgive me, I, let me reset my calculator real quick. So stats, tests, go to number eight. Scroll over to stats, cause I gave you the summary stats, hit enter. And then look, let's put in the values. X bar was 
S sub X is the standard deviation, which was 15.1. N was the sample size, 81. I asked for a 95% confidence level. How many people see this on their calculator? If we round to one decimal place, is that exactly what we got? If you round this to one decimal place, you get 0.5. If you round this to one decimal place, you get 1.7. Liliana, did you get lost on the calculator? So I went stat over to tests. And because I'm, I know it's a T, I want option number eight for T interval. instead of Z interval, like the first part of class we did Z interval. So now I'm gonna do T interval. I go over to stats because I give you the summary stats and I input all the values that I had. And you get the confidence interval that we just did by hand. And don't worry, we're gonna do a, a, like three more examples of these when we come back after Thanksgiving. Okay, so don't stress too much about it. And I'm also gonna post the recording of this class very shortly, okay? Does that help a little bit, Liliana? I hope so. Okay, I don't see anything in the chat. It did, it did not help, huh? <laughs> What's well, giving you the most trouble here? Is it the calculator? Is it like where the values come from? Things like that. I can't get the value you're getting. I don't know how you got this. The are, are you are you going stat over to tests? Okay, go slow. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Hit stat. Mm -hmm. Scroll over to tests. Do you see, go, scroll, do you have a TI-83 or TI-84? Uh, TI-84 plus, but it works as a TI-84 Okay, well scroll down, do you see option number eight there that says T interval? No. You don't see that. Do you see anything that says T interval? Yeah, I got it. All right, so you see T interval, right? Yeah. Hit enter. Scroll over, do you go over, scroll over to hit stats and then enter. And then do you see X bar, S sub X and N? Yeah. Okay, put it in. So put in the 3.8 for X bar, 15.1 for S sub X and 81 for N. Okay. And then when you hit calculate, do you see this? I got it, thank you. I, I didn't hear that, say that again? I, I got it, thank you. Okay, yep, no problem, no problem. I, I get it, it's, it's a weird the first time you do all this stuff, I, I, I understand. Okay, so um, here's what we're gonna do. So just as a reminder, uh, there's no class next Tuesday here. There's no, I'm having no class. There's still college still has class. Um, so I'm going to post a recording of this shortly. Um, and when we come back to class on uh, Tuesday, December 1st. Wow, that's amazing. It's December already, basically. Uh, what we're going to do on the first is we're going to do more examples of this confidence interval stuff. And then we're going to do confidence intervals for a proportion. Okay, I will post. Yep, I will post your homework tomorrow. You won't be able to do all of it, but at least you can get a start on it and take a look at it and see if any problems seem familiar. Um, and then otherwise, everybody have a happy and safe Thanksgiving. Okay.